Hey there, folks. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this Alchemiculture podcast. I'm your host, Phoenix Aurelius, and tonight it's just me chatting with you. Uh, and also the dehydrator. You may hear the dehydrator in the background uh, ramping up and going a little crazy and, you know, the ring-a-ding-ding of a couple of dishes, uh, evaporation dishes clinking against each other, making multitudinous elixirs over here. So uh, we have more items of pharmacopoeia inside of the uh, spagyric apothecary. And unfortunately, I can't put it on pause. Otherwise, it will disrupt uh, the entire workflow that we have going on. So if you can hear that noise, I'm sorry. It's not that big of a deal. I'm certain of it. We'll all get past it. That being said, uh, welcome tonight. Uh, I wanted to chat uh, a little bit more about this idea idea of the inner healer or the inner physician. This is something that Paracelsus talked about. And what kind of prompted me to want to talk about this is that every day we get dozens of emails, or maybe I guess I should say every week we get dozens of emails with people asking us all sorts of things about health and wellness and seeing what my take on this supplement is and that supplement, what spagyric should they take and all these other things. And while I'm honored that people would reach out and, and ask me these types of questions, and I, I'm really grateful that they do because I like to try and give sound advice, um, there's not always a clear answer for them unless I know a great deal about their background, their history, their diet and lifestyle, what they ate for dinner to, you know, today, last night, the week before, and what all of their meals look like, and so on and so forth. I know nothing about their family history. I just don't have enough information to go on to answer all of those things quite as well as I, as I would like. And the truth of the matter is, with all of the things that I have going on these days, I'm not even able to look into this uh, through IDF perspective for most people which is actually why we've been in the background creating a, a program that will launch sometime in 2022, uh, where we will not only be selling SE5s ourselves, but also offering training in how I perform things and the, the theory, the philosophy, the technique, the methodology, all of those things uh, to perform intrinsic data field analysis for oneself and one's family and friends and whatever else. Um, but I'm just not able to do those things for most of those people that write into us. And so, you know, one thing that has made an e enormous, just unspeakable impression on me is Paracelsus' own viewpoint about the inner physician. And in short, you know, he, he basically says that the inner physician is this natural microcosmic component of yourself that causes you to understand what healing actually needs to happen. And in order to access that, there's really only just a couple of steps. First, you have to sit down, be clear, clear your mind and get out of the way of, of your innate knowledge and innate wisdom already coming through. So much of the time we're running on such an intellectual basis with our left brain and you know, all of this analytical data or or sometimes all these other people are running around with emotions about what is wrong and feeling into it and getting so excited about that feeling. And when I say the term excited, I mean that with a, a negative connotation that they're not. And, and that would be right brain frequency. They're not necessarily able to allow the innate wisdom of the body and the innate wisdom that they already have inside of them to come through. And they end up giving their power away to other people, whether that's somebody like me or a doctor or a physician or other people that they feel, quote unquote, know better than them how to heal this particular circumstance that, that they may be going through. And the answer is, while certain specialists have opinions, nobody knows for certain how to heal every condition or every person. That's just, I mean, that's just a given. And if people could begin to tap into their inner physician more, their inner healer, they would have the opportunity to see that they already have the answer to their question at the very point that the question was asked. It just takes a little bit of quieting and accessing this force. So, you know, really quickly, I kind of want to talk about some of this. Uh, Paracelsus, 
which I always refer to because I am a neo Paracelsian. Neo meaning I don't belong in, in the time frame that Paracelsus lived from, you know, 15, uh, sorry, 1493 to about 1541. But, uh, and I didn't come directly after him, you know, so I wasn't even around in the 1600s, or at least not in this incarnation. So I'm not able to call myself a Paracelsian the way that we talk about it historically and anthropologically and, and so on and so forth. But I'm a Neo-Paracelsian, meaning that I'm taking Paracelsian works and I'm putting them into the context of what is new, Neo. So um, I would... I, you know, basically, if there was any one person that I look back to who throughout all of medical and chemical history and actually astrological history, magical history, etc., and I say, wow, this is the person that did the most, that was the most revolutionary, that, you know, was able to heal the most, cure the most, know the most, do the most, it's Paracelsus. Okay. He was a polymath that was just absolutely extraordinary, a massive contender, and we don't get many people like him uh, in the entire history of the world. So when I go back to anything health related, I first say, what did Paracelsus have to say about this? Because again, he's done things that still people today are incapable of doing. And he had very, very simple understanding of things that was so clear and just so concise because he drew his inspiration from nature. And in fact, that's his quote. He says, nature is the first physician, man is second. This is really important because to follow his logic, Paracelsus uh, basically talks about the inner physician. And he believed that all knowledge could be discovered by intuition, by searching within the human mind, because man is a microcosm of the universe, of which nature is part of that, and the principles operating within nature operated in a corresponding way within man itself. And so, realistically, you know, Paracelsus basically says, listen, nature is a living organism. It's an expression of the one life, again, drawing back to the Emerald Tablet, the one thing, the one life, okay? And man is a microcosm or, you know, of course, he was writing in third person as man. Today, we might say woman, female, man, man, woman, you know. And then, of course, not to mention all of the other pronouns that are being preferred today. So, but man is a microcosm of nature and the universe. And so, realistically, because the entire concept of Paracelsian philosophy revolves around the fact that health arises from the harmony between the microcosm and the macrocosm. Therefore, the inner healer is part of the microcosm within man that is able to be explored and tapped into because it is already imbued with the sense of nature. So man and the universe are essentially one in nature, and there is a deep and profound relationship between every part of nature and its corresponding part in man. So in order to understand the causes of disease, a doctor must first be a philosopher. And this is a key tenet of what Paracelsus says. And he tells us all objects in the universe, the macrocosm, were represented in the mind of man, the microcosm, and therefore all knowledge could be discovered by searching within. So this is absolutely important. It's a key critical concept and the inner healer or the inner physician is the most important resource and greatest asset that a single person can ever have or use. So how do we tap into the inner healer? Realistically, it comes down to what I was talking about before. You first have to tone down your mind. Now, anybody who's familiar with various methods of meditation, this is like the first step, okay? You can do it by focusing on something really simply. Within the hermetic tradition, we have various types of breathing, okay? And this isn't just unique to the hermetic tradition, okay? This is this is within the Buddhist tradition. This is within the yogic tradition. This is within the tantric traditions. This is within basically every different tradition that you can see. We even learned the, the very same breathing techniques in Merpatiputi, which is an Indonesian martial art. So all of these different breathing techniques that help to center us in the body and to close down the mind and create a narrow focus and a state of awareness as opposed to attention is really important. 
And one of those we call uh, the square breathing is sometimes what it's called. Um, but you could also do what we call in Merpatiputi Sigitika, which means triangle breath. Uh, basically what it is, is that you exhale all of the breath out of your body and then hold it for a certain count. Now, if you're not accustomed to holding your breath for any length of time, maybe just start with a count of three using your heartbeats as a count. So as you hear, dum -dum, that's one, dum -dum, that's two, dum -dum, that's three, okay? So you exhale all of the breath out of your body, you hold your breath for a count of three, and then you inhale slowly to a count of three, again, using your heartbeats as a guide, and then you hold that breath for a count of three, and then you exhale for a count of three. Again, constantly using your heartbeats as a guide. So if your heartbeat increases or decreases, you just use that as your guide. That helps you tune in to the electromagnetic resonance of the heart, to the feeling of the heart itself, and to syncopate the heart and the breathing. This is very, very important because as the heart becomes really strong in its electromagnetic resonance, it actually changes the brain. And there are, are institutions that are studying this scientifically, like the HeartMath Institute, that have shown that the heart has a much greater electromagnetic field than the brain does, and that the brain and the heart will syncopate just as long as you are focusing on that. So using the heartbeat as your guide, focusing in on your breathing, actually trains your mind to operate at the same frequency as the heart is because you are consciously using your mind and all of your mental faculties to focus on the breath. So if you, a square breathing is basically breathe in for a count of three, hold for a count of three, exhale for a count of three, and hold for a count of three, and then inhale and repeat. Okay, so there are four components to it. That's why we call it square breathing is that you're inhaling for a count of three, holding for a count of three, exhaling for a count of three, holding for a count of three, and repeating. Okay, so there are four steps. Sigitaga, or triangle breath, is the exact same thing, except you just inhale for a count of three, hold for a count of three, exhale for a count of three, and then back to inhale. Okay, so there's only three steps, therefore, Sigitaga, or triangle breath. So, these are methods that can be used in order to syncopate the heart and the brain and the breath and to really calm down the mind. Now, traditionally, when we do this in the hermetic tradition, we sit in a chair and the chair has to have a straight back on it. You rest your upper back against the back of the chair. Your legs are perfectly square at the knee so that your feet are resting at the ground and they are again perfectly square to the shins so you are sitting and then your your hands are either resting on your lap or on armchair uh if it's an armchair then you know you're going to have the the armrest and they're just resting there with palms up or down doesn't really particularly matter but we call this the egyptian meditation uh meditation posture within the hermetic tradition and so oftentimes we sit in a chair we perform this egyptian meditation posture and then we perform this breathing now this breathing can oftentimes either be um uh i lost the word that i wanted to say it's pre something uh basically we we can um have as a precursor let's phrase it a different way um this practice of tensing up our body from our head all the way down to our toes, tensing and releasing, tensing and releasing, tensing and releasing just a few times in order to release any of that excess energy or tension that's held in the body and really able to relax and then being able to perform this breathing. Or you can do the breathing first and then the tensing after that it really doesn't matter. Um, and then I like to run myself through visual uh, visualizations, the same ones that are in my energy tool album. Um, which are basically like grounding, running energy, et cetera, et cetera. That way I know that my energy, as far as I can tell, my astral energy, my causal energy, my spiritual energy, they're all being fed. Even if my physical energy is still somewhat out of whack and there's something going on, at least these other forms of energy, as far as I can visualize and feel and, and get them in harmony, are able to be uh, activated 
potentized, balanced, et cetera, so that my inner physician has the best platform with which to speak. And then from there, it's just really giving yourself permission to speak with your inner healer, have a dialogue within your mind, with your own inner healer, your own inner physician, addressing what is wrong? What is the imbalance? What is the root of the imbalance? Are there any herbs? Are there any vitamins? Are there any nutrition? Are there any foods that I can consume that are going to help to balance this? What is the source, for instance, of the imbalance? And this is where, because this is a Paracelsian practice, this is where in my personal practice, I always ask, is the source of the imbalance enzastrale? Does it do have something to do with the positions of planets? Two, is it ens naturale? If so, this is where foods and herbs and diet, lifestyle, movement, things like that can really come into play. Is it ens veneni, which is the cause of disease due to toxins? Okay, toxins appear in many different ways. Of course, you know, we think about toxins, we think about, you know, uh, pathogenic chemicals such as, you know, diesel exhaust and car exhaust and paint fumes and, and propellants and all of these other chemical toxins. We think about heavy metals, of course, but anything consumed in excess is technically a toxin. So if you breathe in a little bit of, uh, you know, a pyrolytic uh, petroleum exhaust from a car, that those things should not even be in the body in the first place. And so any amount of those are consumed by the breath in the body in excess, and that becomes toxic, okay? Same thing with heavy metals. Most heavy metals need the slightest, slightest presence inside of the body in order for the body to function properly. So anything consumed in excess there also going to be a major issue. Um, and then of course, you know, vitamin A, vitamin B even, okay? Vi vitamin B and vitamin C are much less toxic because if they're produced in excess, they're water soluble. You drink a lot of water, they're able to flush out of the body. That's no big deal. But some of the fat soluble vitamins stay particularly within the hepatic system of the liver and the gallbladder, and they can stay there for long periods of time, especially if there are things like fatty liver disease and uh, excess fats inside of the body, excess body fat, things like this. So those, you know, those are things that you need to really be aware of in terms of, of their toxicity. And the fat soluble vitamins would be vitamin A, uh, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, K2, of course, uh, things like that. Um, then we also have, you know, other nutrients like are you getting too much manganese or are there imbalances of certain minerals such as iron, zinc, copper? All of these have to be in very particular balanced ratios within the body. Otherwise, it can do wonky things with your red blood cell reproduction, with other different functions of the body that uh, they are uh, dependent upon, right, that, that they interface with. So... It's very, very important to realize that diet itself, by taking too much of a certain nutrient or even a phytochemical, something that you might find in an herbal supplement, is not good. Excess is toxicity. And it can be just as, as potent um, having too much of a particular thing in your body as not having enough. And sometimes with certain things, it actually creates the exact same symptom. So the only way unless you're to go get tested for these things, you know, or to test yourself for these things or to use kinesiology or whatever, is to actually connect with your inner physician in order to get those answers because within you, you already know the answer. So that's ens veneni, okay? Now we have ens spirituale. Is this the result of electromagnetic phenomena impacting me? Now by phenomena, it could actually just be electromagnetism in general, right? So if you have a tri-field meter, if you don't have a tri-field meter, buy yourself a tri-field meter for God's sake, okay? Every home should have this in the modern day. They're, you know, about 168 bucks or something. Uh, I'll have Nori put the link uh, to the one that we use down in the description below so that you can uh, know what I have and what I'm referring to. But basically, it's going to test electric fields, magnetic fields, weighted electric weighted magnetic and RF frequencies. 
Now, if you go anywhere in your house and you're picking up larger than uh, than than suggested uh, EMF fields inside of your environment and RF fields, that's dangerous. That's going to contribute to en spirituale. Okay, so that's not a phenomena. That's just electromagnetic energy, smog, and pollution. And you have one of two choices: either completely ground it out or try and eliminate it through whatever means possible. There are a number of different ways of doing that. Or structure it. Just like water, electromagnetism has a flow. And if it's unstructured, then it's all chaotic and it's all over the place. If it's structured, then it doesn't actually have the same harmful effect and can actually be used and drawn upon coherently by organic life forms. So it's very important that you uh, consider how your electromagnetic environment is is interacting if you're one of those people that doesn't keep your phone on airplane mode all the time unless you're going to make a call or expecting a call or deliberately responding to a text or whatever well i feel bad for you first of all you should definitely consider like uh uh what do they call those things a bio arc for your phone bio arcs are very inexpensive and they can help to structure some of that electricity and electromagnetic flow. But even beyond that, you're inundating yourself with unnecessary electricity and carrying it on your body. Like I cringe every time I see a woman pull her phone out of her, her bra or every time that I see an old man have a shirt pocket on the left hand side or hell, even on the right hand side where they are keeping their phone and keeping it on all the time, or God forbid that they're putting it in their pocket and irradiating their testicles and genitals and, and reproductive organs and stuff. I mean, it's just absolute madness. People just must think that what they can't see doesn't affect them. And that's for lack of a better term, completely insane, but still, uh, consider structuring those things because that's the first form of in spirituale that is most common. But then you can also have, you know, weird geological electromagnetic phenomena such as vortices that can affect people. Um, and those are very real. I've dealt with multiple different cases of that. In fact, uh, using IDF study very early on when I was still outsourcing uh, to a guy named Richard to do all of our IDF analysis, I had a client who's also a very good friend of mine who lives in, in uh, one of the areas in Salt Lake, and she was constantly getting migraines. Her kids were having very difficult menstruation, all these other things. What ended up happening was that we ran through the entire house and we found like, okay, yeah, there are a couple of places where this is really odd, but then we, we got a photograph of her, her yard and actually went through the entire property line and found that there was definitively a vortex that was very, very harmful right on her property. And so we were able to show her how she has to dig this particular hole, put in some copper conduit of a very, at a very certain depth and of a very certain diameter down into the ground, fill it with basalt and gypsum and uh, sea salt and a number of other things and keep it there so that this would actually anchor all of that electromagnetism that was trying to come up into the ground and actually ground it uh, so that it wasn't just creating stray electromagnetic effects. So I've seen, and I've seen plenty of cases of that. In fact, there's one at the University of Utah. Uh, there's a, a building there where they do all sorts of research and everybody's working on computers and everybody just kind of jokes like, oh yeah, it must just be a toxic environment that we live in. Ha 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 ha. But they all have like severely debilitating conditions ranging from migraines to endocrine issues to nervous system things and shooting pains and like, I mean, just like everything that you can imagine. And they're just sitting there just kind of joking about it. All the while their inner healer is like, hey, take it serious, take it serious. But that is one of the places with electromagnetic uh, radiation due to vortex that is absolutely insane as well. But then you have other forms of electromagnetic phenomena, which we would refer to as sometimes as paranormal phenomena that relate to spirits and what we could by any other name call an entity okay whether we're talking about it from the irish tradition calling it a fae or a fairy or the she um whether we're talking about it from the arabic tradition calling it jinn whether we are you know talking about uh, elves of the icelandic norse tradition whether we're talking about you know any of these types of cre creatures unseen creatures and entities that exist you know they they're 
rife with them down in the Amazon rainforest as well. You know, and there's all sorts of regional names from tribe to tribe that talk about them. And even within just uh, basic Spanish speaking culture uh, down there as well. And, and I mean, they literally exist all over the world. Africa has their own traditions. Everybody has their own traditions of these unseen spirits that can be interacted with. Uh, but they interact with us through subtle means of electromagnetism because they're electromagnetic. They interface primarily with the systems of our body that interface with electromagnetism, which are, as we uh, have talked about before, the nervous system and the endocrine system. So this is something that people really need to understand. And then finally, we have Ensdei. And Ensdei is the cause of disease due to God. And this is really just a very simple thing. It's like, have I done anything in my past or in my present that has transgressed my own conscience that I feel bad about that I have not atoned for? And what does atonement mean? Well, atonement literally means coming to peace with that transgression, being able to integrate it into the personality, admit it to yourself that it was wrong, and express some form of contrition and perform some act of contrition for what you did. Try and recompense the person that you have wronged or the situation that you have wronged. Do something that shows that I acknowledge what, what I did was wrong and here's what I'm doing now and in the future to ensure that this doesn't happen again, that I don't transgress my own conscience. That will basically solve any issue of ends they or cause of disease due to God. And again, Paracelsus was highly monotheistic and very influenced by the Catholic tradition. And so, you know, what he perceives as God can actually be perceived many different ways outside of religious context, just with your internal Jiminy Cricket, which is to say your conscience. So with that being said, um, these are the five entia that I always take into consideration. Uh, again, ens astrale, ens naturale, ens venene, ens spirituale, ens dei. These five things create the major imbalance. And if you just ask your inner healer, you don't even really need to know about these things physiologically. You already know about them subconsciously, okay? In fact, if I put any of you into hypnosis, which all hypnosis is self-hypnosis, that's principle number one of all hypnosis, okay? So if I put any of you into hypnosis and lay you out in a room, especially a room that I've never even been in, that you've never been in, I can actually, depending on the depth that I put you into or help facilitate you to get into yourself, then you can actually tell me how many pounds of copper wire uh, circuitry are running through that entire building. You could tell me, you know, every last drop, how many milliliters of paint went into actually painting the walls in the building or like I, yeah, absurd things that you have no way of knowing consciously you are able to dredge up these details very confidently and certainly from the subconscious and deeper unconscious portions of your reality it's very very simple to do actually with just a small amount of training and so the key here with the relaxation getting into these deep states of meditation then having this conversation with your own inner physician is by any other term a form of hypnotic uh i can't say trance it's like a hypnotic conversation with yourself with your own higher self with your own subconscious in fact your higher self one of its multitudinous skills one of its many many uh fortes is healing your body why because you have a body and you need that so it's there in order to do that for you you just have to help understand how you can utilize faculties of relaxation, meditation, basic self-hypnosis, etc., to get into the states that are conducive for this. So this is a perfect time for a break. Let's go ahead and take a break, take a breath, and we'll be back here in just a sec. Thanks again for listening. Maybe like us, you're not too hip on all the wireless radiation penetrating us all the time and disorienting the harmonious state of the natural world. The World Health Organization even admits that cell phone radiation is a Class B carcinogen, and the scientific studies of the deleterious effects of wireless radiation on health grows larger each day. But BioArc discs structure the radiation that's around us, rendering it harmless and even beneficial according to the tests that we and some others have run on them. BioArc discs come in three sizes, 
small for cell phones, tablets, computers, and personal electronics, medium for Wi-Fi routers, large televisions, and other household electronics, and large for entire rooms, computer server stations, and other large-scale needs. We have a BioArc disk on all of our tablets, phones, computers, electrical devices, hell, even on our fridge and our Wi-Fi router. Using our Trifield EMF meter here at the Research Academy, we've shown that the RF frequency, the standard and weighted magnetic fields, and the standard and weighted electrical fields are all drastically reduced back into safe zones using the simple invention. For a limited time, you can get four small bio arcs for your personal electronics and one medium bio arc for your wireless modem or router for only $164.79 with free shipping when you order the bio arc family pack using the affiliate link on our website. Visit phoenixrelius.org, click on the media tab, and then scroll down to the Alchemiculture podcast page. Then just click on the bio arc family pack and order yours today. As with all the links on our podcast page, this company offers us a small percentage of sales to help fund our research and make this podcast a possibility. So go ahead, get your BioArc disc today and start structuring the radiation in your environment. Welcome back from that short break. Before we took a little break, we were just talking about the inner healer. We were talking about the anti of disease. We were talking about how to contact the the inner healer, this inner physician. Realistically, all it takes is a little bit of time and practice, just like anything, accessing these subconscious or energetic healing aspects of yourself. They take a little bit of practice, just like going to the gym, right? Well, you can't go to the gym and just expect to bench press 500 pounds right out of the gate. You're going to have to really work your way up to that starting with wherever you're from at the present moment. It's the same thing with a lot of these psychic tools and, and uh, you know, subconscious tools, subconscious awareness type um, methodologies. You just have to spend some time with it. So focus on your breathing, get calm, release the tension from your body. And if it's easier for you, you may consider putting on some good music something that is healing, something that, you know, maybe 417 hertz frequencies um, or 528 frequencies, right? Different solfeggio frequencies. You can use the assistance of various crystals, especially if they're cleansed, cleared, and charged. That's the best way of doing it. Uh, You can use lots of different things to help you access these higher faculties of yourself, okay? Some, Some stones and crystals that might be more efficacious than others would be, say, moldavite, phenakite, merlinite. Uh, You might even consider using shungite for some grounding aspects. Um, You can use, golly, there's just so many. Um, Man, there's one that I always carry on my person that I'm having a hard time remembering right now, but anything that's going to connect with third, third eye, like uh, uh, Vishuddhi chakra, anything that's going to connect you with your crown and and or third eye. These are things that are really going to help. And again, with throat chakra, that that can help too quite a bit, um, simply because you want to have the capacity to communicate your desires to the subconscious aspects. So, you know, throat chakra, third eye chakra, crown chakra would basically be the main things. you know, there, there's just so many ways of actually relating to it from many different disciplines that there's no one right way or wrong way of doing it. It's just calming down the body, getting into it, having this dialogue with your inner physician. And if you're new to all of this or skeptical about it, just give yourself permission to play. When you give yourself permission to play and I, you know, uh, you, you really begin to understand that you're just playing during play, you give yourself permission and let your guard down in a way that you can actually ascertain information or, or view things in a way that otherwise you have this very rigid structural mental block uh, and, and or fundamental belief system around being able to access. So getting over that and being able to drop into your own innate wisdom and being able to converse with it as if it were a person, much easier. And then from there, you know, asking, I I always suggest asking which one of the entia of disease is a major contributing factor to the conditions that you have at present. 
And once you have that information, then ask it, what do I do about this? And you will find that there are multitudinous ways of going about your own self-healing. This doesn't mean that you can 100% just replace uh, this technique for, uh, you know, actual good professional help or, you know, get rid of all of your physicians or everything just right off the bat. But over time, this is something that I have learned to do. I haven't relied on a physician for anything but stitches and actually as a physician's assistant for anything but stitches, broken bones, major things that you just cannot heal yourself. And again, Paracelsus is very clear. You only access help from outside. You only ask for help from outside when all of the resources of your inner physician are exhausted, which is to say that you already know the answer nine times out of 10, possibly more than that. And only if the inner physician is completely exhausted, has already tried all of the avenues that it knows how to try, is it really then a good idea to start asking other people looking for help, etc. And even at that, filtering who you go to through your inner physician is a technique that I strongly suggest. And it's something that I've been doing for years and years and years and years, meaning that um, I don't go and see anybody that I don't have a very strong connection with and that my inner healer isn't like, yes, they, they have the answer, go to them. Um, so yeah, very simple, very easy actually in principle, but this is something that is so lacking in our modern day and it's so foundationally critical and important that we begin to reintegrate this knowledge because again, you already know how to heal yourself if you just get into these very deep states of awareness and connect with your inner microverse and begin to really connect with that nature and find what is out of balance. It's actually quite simple. Having some information uh, available to your conscious mind can make it even easier because then the subconscious and the conscious mind can dialogue much, much easier. There's already terminology that the subconscious and the conscious agree upon. Otherwise, the subconscious are going to give you ideas. They're going to give you symbols. They're going to give you images. They're going to give you feelings that you then have to interpret with the conscious mind. And there is room for error anytime that you interpret or translate things, whether that be a language or whether that be, you know, intuitive information or subconscious information to the conscious mind. But as long as you get them dialoguing, you're going to be on the right track. And then it's just a little bit of trial and error. Okay. So it's really not rocket science. It's impeccably easy, but it's the very first step that I think everybody should begin implementing. And again, this isn't to replace uh, a physician or any you know certified or clinical herbalist or other things that you're working with. This is actually a preliminary step before that to see if there's anything that you can do that is going to actually help to address the situation. And this could be preventative, it could be diagnostic, and that's that. And if it's completely out of your hands and your own inner physician is completely exhausted, well, guess what? Then you just go to the sources that you're already going to for your primary wellness care. So very simple. And uh, I guess I need to give this FDA disclaimer that uh, none of this information is intended to diagnose, treat, cure, prevent any disease or illness. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So now that you've got that, if you have any questions, go ahead and let us know in the comments. Uh, be sure to share this information. It's, it might be really simple, yeah, but it's very, very impactful. Share this information, teach it to your kids, teach it to everybody because it's just getting ridiculous how out of personal power and out of touch with their own inner physician, like 95% of the people that I see are today. And it really doesn't take much to be able to get people into their own personal power regarding this and being able to start working from a place where they can try to self address and self um, correct a lot of the issues that they already are experiencing as a result of imbalances in their lifestyle and their diet and their lack of movement in you know their their lack of awareness of invisible forces 
and so on and so forth. So pretty easy stuff. Go ahead and, and uh, share it. If you like this episode, be sure to like it, subscribe to us, hit bell notification if you haven't already, if you're watching on YouTube. If uh, you have any questions, post them in the comments. I'll definitely get around to looking at these and responding to these. And um, yeah, if, if for whatever reason you have something very particular or want to write into us, you can always reach us at support at phoenixrelius.org. As always, thank you so much for listening. This has been an alchem alchemical culture podcast, and I am your host, Phoenix Aurelius. Have a great night.